My name is Carlos Morales. I work for Child Protective Services in San Antonio, Texas from February 2012 to March 2013. And I'm guilty. I'm guilty of what many other Americans are guilty of, which is believing that an agency, even though it's committed atrocity after atrocity, has the best interests of children and, and families in mind. I'm guilty of working for an agency that has hampered freedom repeatedly that has done things that are so unconstitutional that it would make the DEA blush. I'm guilty of working for an agency that has promoted the drug war in a way, again, that would make the DEA blush. Because we've removed children for the faults of their parents, but those faults are them smoking pot while they were in high school. I'm guilty of working for an agency that has thrown children in foster homes, that has kidnapped children and thrown them in foster homes, where they are six times more likely to die than in abusive homes. I'm guilty of working for Child Protective Services. Within CPS, we, we hurt. We did not help. We did what Adolf Hitler always spoke of, which is to take control of children. Because by doing so, you take control of the future. Of course, following the Prussian system, the United States took over children first through public education, but now they do it through the state ownership of children because within the United States, the parent does not own the child. The state does. Within Child Protective Services, you know, there's always this claim that all the bad things that occur is because of a few bad apples, because of a few bad individuals. That's why they have a bad reputation. Not that the entire agency is based on the idea that it is important to remove children from their homes. It's based around the idea that you are guilty until proven innocent. We used force, not finesse, because that's all the state knows. That's all the state can do. You know, you know it's kind of to take it back to me. In, in my first case, which was my best case, we went out to a home. When we got there, there were DEA agents swarmed around the house, and. I could hear the DEA speaking badly about one of the parents. I saw the door. The door had been broken open. I got into the house and there was this smell, this terrible smell, but I couldn't quite figure out what it was. The couches were flipped over, there were beer cans in the back, there was no electricity to knock out this terrible smell. I, again, I was just, it just stunk the entire house. I turned around the corner and I saw another door that had been broken in. And I realized what the smell was. It was the, uh, the shit of children, fecal matter, all on the walls, all on the floor. Because that's where the drug dealers were storing their drugs. In order to prevent people from coming in and stealing it, it was a way to prevent that. Of course, this kind of disgusting uh, display of actions by drug dealers would be impossible without the drug war, which is funded by the state. You know, that's kind of outside the point. What occurred afterwards was I left the house and I heard a woman screaming. That woman was the mother. She was begging for her child. She was stating that it was because of a bad situation that they were in the home, that they had only been there for a few days. We weren't able to figure out whether or not that was true, but we could tell that this woman was in quite despair. The CPS investigator I was with, though, well, she didn't really care. She showed a lack of empathy. A lack of empathy that is all around the agency. The woman cried and the investigator actually laughed. Laughed at her despair. I heard some other people speaking. They were running towards the house. They were the neighbors. They were family members. And they begged to be able to keep the children, to prevent them from going to the foster home. And even though supposedly Child Protective Services aims to keep families together, there wasn't even an attempt to check if these children should go with that family. They were yelling about how foster homes are places where children are routinely molested, and drugged, and abused. And the investigator I was with yet again laughed at this idea. And in my mind, in my naive mind, I thought, we're the heroes today. We're the ones who are preventing these kids from living a bad life. We threw him in the back of, a, of my car. We drove off and threw him in a foster home. And again, I felt like I was a hero. 
But in those foster homes, those, those kids were drugged. They were abused, they were thrown into another public system. And they were no better off than when we first got there. In any case, they were much worse off. And you gotta kind of ask yourself, who is an investigator? Who are these people who are taking children away? Well, it's not like they're well prepared for what they're doing. You see, in Child Protective Services, all you need is a bachelor's degree. And that bachelor's degree, in some cases, was a degree in saxophone jazz from Berkeley College of Music. That, coupled with two months of training, is what makes an investigator. That investigator has to be a therapist because they have to be able to tell when someone is lying. They also have to be able to ask questions without bias to children who are four years old. They have to be a police officer because they have to go into highly dangerous situations or what they believe to be highly dangerous situations. They have to be a judge because they have to be able to dictate what's going to occur to these people. And they have to be a psychic because they have to use the powerful tool of violent central planning to dictate exactly what's going to happen to these people. And be able to guess with their wonderful aura of imagination what's going to occur to these children. There is a hero complex and there's a culture of martyrdom that goes on in Child Protective Services because what you're told is that you're the one who's going to help all these children. You're the one who's going to save all the kids and you're God Almighty. You see, what happens is it's not as Alex Jones puts it where there's a bonus given for every single child that is kidnapped by a CPS investigator. No. You see, what happens is that you get reviewed every month. And for every child that has been kidnapped from their home, the investigator is given a raise, a raise by the end of the year. You see, the locus of control is always removed by investigator to investigator from supervisor to the state in order to not have to have the feeling of self-responsibility. And while removing that locus of control, you can always blame any kind of inaccuracies or terrible atrocities that occur on someone else. So it's never as in front, it's never as clear that simply you're given a bonus for every child that you steal but in many, many ways, you're still considered the hero because the person who removes three kids in a week, well, that person's applauded. The person who prevents three children from being removed in a week, well, that person's called lazy. And what I saw in Child Protective Services was not the prevention of abuse because physical abuse was rarely what we ever dealt with. I'm an individual who recognizes and acknowledges the fact that Physical abuse traumatizes a child in ways that we can't even possibly imagine. Study after sh study shows that even though we use the term spanking, it really is a violent action against children, but in Child Protective Services, spanking isn't what's incorrect. No, they're, they're, you're allowed to get away with that. What's incorrect is physical and emotional neglect, which are two terms that are easily abused, and they're abused by Child Protective Services. You see, if you admit to using marijuana on a weekend when you weren't with your kids, that's considered emotional and physical neglect. And that can lead to the removal of children. Because uh, yet again, we're just continuously using the drug war to destroy these families. But what's even worse is the kind of evidence that we used. You see, anonymous reporter can call in to Child Protective Services and say, Oh, these, these parents, they're molesting children, they're abusing them, they're snorting cocaine off their asses of their children, they're part of the mafia, they have guns. You see, they can make up whatever they want and Child Protective Services will go out and carry out the investigation in which we will ask four-year-old children if they've ever been touched by their parent. With, and again, we're using shaky evidence based off the memory of the memory of the memory of the memory of another individual. And supposedly with that, that's enough evidence to call for the removal of a child. And what's best, is that even if we're able to disprove every single claim, if we can get the parent to admit to anything in regards to drugs, we still get the removal. So even if the claim and allegations weren't even in regards to that, we can still use it to take them away. And you have to wonder why is it Child Protective Services has the incentive to take away children and not to help them out? Well, it's because for every single removal Child Protective Services gets, that's another grant that the state will give them. 
because Child Protective Services is based off of this system. And the collusion between foster homes and CPS is even, well, it's even more tragic. Because you see, foster homes get more money for every single child that they get. This is how we have 650,000 kids right now in foster homes. But what makes it worse is that for every single diagnosis a child gets, that foster home is given more money. Now these diagnoses, they're not the child being paralyzed, no. You see, what happens is you take a child, you throw them into a state hospital, and then that's where they come up with the diagnosis. You see, if a kid is removed from his home, his church, his community, his school, you throw him into a foster home where he's more likely to be abused, raped, and murder, where he doesn't want to be, that kid might lash out. He might go against authority. He might not be able to pay attention to school. He might not be able to pay attention to the dictates of adults who he does not know. Well, it's not the situation that's wrong. It's not the, the social order that's wrong. No, it's that that kid is suffering from a mental illness that needs to be remedied through the use of drugs. You see, that kid, according to them, has oppositional defiant disorder. ADHD, manic depression, schizophrenia, and insomnia. Well, that's now several diagnoses that that child has, which means more money for the foster home. And this is how you get 80% of foster children being diagnosed with a mental disorder, 80%. And those children, on average, being in those foster homes for two years. These drugs, they're not light. There are 9 million children in the United States on antipsychotic medication. Medications with over 40 side effects. And there's no clinical tests on these kids because they consider that to be immoral. No. They make guinea pigs out of children. They make guinea pigs out of people in the midst of their development. At the worst points of their life. And what's even worse is when your child ends up in foster home, well, that's when you have to go to court, you see. But the issue is, is that the judge and the prosecutor are paid by the same people. And those people will benefit from those children being removed. I've had judges check their email in the middle of court cases while a mother is crying. And I've seen judges laugh at these people because they think they're irresponsible or terrible because CPS stated so. It's so unconstitutional that it, that it, it makes you kind of hurt because there's no jury. It's all the dictates of the judge. It can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to get out of a case. I was recently helping out someone who was in West Virginia and it cost them $200,000 to try and disprove a claim that their child is being molested. And is there any kind of money given back to them? Well, of course not. Because this is a game to them. I've heard prosecutors, defense attorneys, and judges joking outside of courtrooms about the cases that they're involved in. So what you have to think about is, what do you do if Child Protective Services comes after you and your family? Because there's a good chance they can. We're all one call away if you're a parent from Child Protective Services coming after you. First off, if your child is in public schooling, get them out. But I mean, if you can't, um, what you have to do is let your child know about CPS, even if they're five years old, which sounds daunting, it sounds terrible, but you see, because Child Protective Services and the state owns a child, they can come to a child at any point and ask them questions. And that's what builds their evidence. You see, as an investigator, I would go out to public schools, remove a child from the classroom that you might now already want to be in, throw them in a room, usually a dark room, where the child is scared, and there's a large Hispanic man who's asking him questions regarding sexual molestation by his parents. The child probably wants to leave, he probably wants to get out, and he might answer yes or no to questions that he does not understand. And what that child does not realize is that they, yes or no is sealing his fate. That's why you need to let your child know about CPS and to know that no matter what question they ask, tell them to tell the CPS investigator, I do not want to talk to you, no matter what, no matter how pushy they are, just simply state, I don't want to talk to you. Now, 
if you've gotten to that point, what occurs next is the CPS investigator coming to your home. Hello, my name is Dan. I'm from Child Protective Services. Can I please come into your home? This is where you state no. Although I'm not the biggest fan of the Constitution, you still have the Fourth Amendment and occasionally gets to be respected. A Child Protective Service investigator is not allowed into your home unless he has a warrant. And if it's an anonymous report, well then he has nothing. He can't get a warrant. The actual amount of paperwork and judges and everyone else that he has to go through in order to get a warrant is incredibly daunting to an investigator who's probably bored and inefficient in their job because he's a state worker. So don't let them inside your house. Because if you let them inside your house, they can use three dirty plates. Right? They'll use three dirty plates as evidence of hoarding and be able to remove your kid for that. And it's occurred. It's, it's not a joke. So don't let them in. The investigator will then ask you questions. They'll ask you about your family history. They'll ask you about domestic violence. They'll ask you about how you were raised as a kid. And they'll, they might be gentle. They might be nice when they do it. But they're not your fucking therapist, okay? No matter what has occurred in your life, do not admit that you were abused as a child because they'll use that as evidence against you. Do not admit that your husband ever hit you because they'll use that as evidence against you. I was dealing with one case, this was actually in Texas, where the mother admitted that her husband had hit her. This husband, though, had been out of the house for three years and they still removed the child because they called it a risk factor. So don't admit to anything. Secondly, record the interview. No matter what, get a recording device, get out your phone. Most people have smartphones, but if you have even a tape recorder they can buy for a dollar at a Goodwill, use it. Because the interview that, you're, that, that is given to the investigator, well, it's not given word to word. That's not how the report is written. It's a summary of the investigation. So based off of the biases of that investigator, that's how they write at the report, a lot of times through memory. And then they'll use that against you. So make sure you record everything. Say as little as possible. They're looking for contradictions. Most importantly, don't trust them. They are not looking to help you. They are the enemy. They may ask for a drug test. Now this is where you have to decide. Usually what they have is an oral drug test. They, they, they put it in your mouth, you have to wait like two or three minutes until the saliva gets in and they'll be able to tell what drugs you're on. If you have not used any forms of medication in the last three days, if you have not smoked marijuana, used quaaludes or any other drug in the last three days, you're probably gonna pass this test and you'll be fine. If not, they're most likely gonna try to get a warrant, if the allegation is one of drug use, uh, to do a urine sample test. And it gets a little bit more tricky here. Um, I will state there are some websites and maybe head shops that sell things which allow you to pass those tests. I'm not gonna go into too much detail there, but I'm sure you can find it yourself with just a little internet search. Say no to private interviews with your child. They will manipulate your child in order to try to get information. If the allegation is of physical abuse, you can bring your child up to the door and lift up their shirt to show that there is no bruising, or, and, you can bring the child to a doctor afterwards, um, and they will take pictures to show that there's no physical abuse, and you will keep that report, do not give that report back to the CPS investigator, unless you end up in court. Expect coercion, and write everything down. See, what you wanna do is you wanna keep a journal, on that journal, you want to write on the header, notes to my attorney. This ensures attorney-client uh, confidentiality, and this will prevent them from being able to use it in court. In that journal, write notes on every meeting, notes on every visitation, notes about the court hearings, notes on anything out of the ordinary that occurs, counseling appointment notes, notes about if there's a psychological evaluation, a record of all drug tests and results, and any visitation notes, if, it, if you get to that situation. If you go to court, lawyer up. There's no way to win, unless you, you yourself are a lawyer. You see, judges don't trust the parents. They may trust attorneys. Make sure you get a family court lawyer, though, because most lawyers are not equipped to be able to fight in a court case where the Constitution is absolutely not respected, and neither are any of the normal laws of the land. 
Now we have to realize is why this is important to activists. Anyone who fights against the system will be fought against by the system. I actually left Texas before I even made any claims about ever working for Child Protective Services on my podcast, The Renegade Variety Hour. I was afraid. I was afraid of what CPS could do. Now, thankfully, I don't have you know any kids. Uh, I'm not married. My siblings are all over 18, so the people that they can attack are limited. But if you have a family, and say you're a marijuana activist, well, in Austin, Texas, they kidnapped a kid for a parent being a marijuana activist, and that kid died in foster home. Don't fuck around. Don't smoke weed in public if you're a parent. I know to some of the civil disobedience folks, this seems like you're giving up. It's not. Fight for your causes. Stand up for yourself. But realize that they will come and they will come for you. I think, in conclusion, Child Protective Services is a system that profits off of converting children into cash while destroying their families and communities. Stay strong, stay righteous in your indignation towards this system, towards this criminal enterprise. And I will continue to fight against this criminal organization with every breath I take. Thank you.